Hi, guys. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. We start. My name is Krasimira Manashvi, and I am the program coordinator of ARC Academy. ARC Academy is the place where creation grow into professionals at the game and film industry. For four years, the Academy created four programs, and this year's years, nearly 100 students from Bulgaria, Romania, and the region are studying in at the Academy. With us today, Mikhail Lazar, lecturer and senior monetization designer at the Polish game development company, Flying Light Hawk. He will tell us more about the game economy and progression system. Mihai has been working in the game industry for 17 years. He has spent the last six years focusing in the game economics and monetization systems. As game and level designer, Mihai worked on some famous mobile games, Nova 2, Nova 3, and Modern Combat and Eclipse. Mihail, it's a pleasure for me. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here as well. Thank you for having me. And hi, everyone. OK, you can start with. Uh, OK, uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Mihai. I'm a monetization designer at Flying Wild Hog. Uh, I've started uh, in this industry in 2005 as a quality assurance tester. After a while, uh, a year and a half or so, I realized that I actually want to produce games uh, and switch to the production side of things. And I became a game designer. Uh, I was working in Gameloft at the time. And in Gameloft, uh, being a game designer also meant that you are a level designer as well. So I did a bit of both for quite a while. And at some point, I realized that I need to see other or different perspectives on game development. So I joined uh, King, uh, the studio they had in Bucharest uh, at the time. And after a year spent there, due to some uh, uh, you know, studio closures uh, that is happening in the industry much too often. Uh, I had to leave King and went back to Gameloft. And that's when I realized that there are a lot more things uh, about game design that I ever suspected. So I decided to focus and specialize myself in, in economy design and monetization. Uh, more than six months ago, I would say eight months ago, I joined Flying Wild Hog uh, Studios in Poland, working remotely, and we are working on a, a looter shooter game. It's in early access, free. If you want to try it out, see what the deal is. It's called Space Punks, and it's on Epic currently, only on Epic. Uh, Today, or this evening, I will be telling you guys a bit more about what uh, game economy design means for games and um, what exactly a uh, game economy designer does in, in game loft mostly, because that's where most of my experience is. So for those of you who... <clears throat> who already know about this stuff and already seen the, the following presentations, uh, they might be a bit boring. I know there are some members in the audience that uh, uh, have seen this already. But for the rest of you, uh, whenever you have any questions, uh, just write them in the chat. Let me know. Uh, I mean, it's that kind of presentation where uh, we can stop what we're doing and and uh, focus on what we need to explore. 
So without further ado, I will be sharing my screen and let's do this. Okay, it should be visible now. So game economic design, what, what is this about? What does economic design mean? Uh, a brief description for, for what the game economy designer would be doing. He would be, uh, I like to call it a poly, polyvalent uh, person because you would need to, as a game economy designer, would need to, to interact with more disciplines than design. But the main one is the design discipline where, because you need to understand and modify the, the gameplay uh, with the, the decisions we are making. Of course, economy, because we need to take care of the interactions between the game elements. One uh, of the other main focuses of the game economy designer is the balance, you know, because we need to ensure that the game has a difficulty and that difficulty scales. Uh, monetization is something that is mostly relevant to free-to-play games, but with the monetization, we provide the room for purchases in the game. And then comes the fun part, uh, the tracking, because we need to define what and how uh, we need to measure in the game, how the players are interacting with whatever we are doing. And the analysis part, because we need to evaluate the game performance uh, and decide how we are moving forward uh, with the game. The key skills that a game economy designer would need uh, would be, first of all, analytical thinking, like being good at games and understanding them is a sign of good analytical thinking. But what I'm mostly referring here is when we are playing games, uh, we do need to ask ourselves why a particular thing, a feature, a mechanic, a system, doesn't matter what, why this thing in particular is working, is successful, or if it's not successful, why it doesn't work. Uh, another thing that it's quite relevant is to understand key math concepts like basic algebra. But if you know how to calculate percentages, we're pretty good. Probabilities, another thing that's it's, it's important, and graphs. Graphs are relevant for progression, and we will see later on why. Um, now, because I mentioned earlier uh, the analysis uh, discipline, of course, we need to know a bit about statistics, like some knowledge on distributions, errors, basically enough to use the data. But don't worry about this, because this is uh, not something vital. Uh, in many companies, the analysis part is done by uh, game analysts, the game economy designer does, has nothing to do with it. But my recommendation for a, anyone is to make their own analysis because this is the best way to understand how your players are interacting with the game. And of course, we need to know a bit about economics and marketing. Sorry. Um, this is because we need to have an understanding of what motivates the players and what do they want from the game. And we also need to know the difference between cost and value and how to use this difference, these, these uh, aspects. And of course, our best friend in this whole journey is Excel or Google spreadsheets or wh whatever spreadsheet program uh, you are familiar with because 90% uh, of a game economy designer's job is working with uh, spreadsheets. 
Okay, some key concepts of uh, the economy design. The first, and in my opinion, the most important one would be balance. Uh, whenever we are thinking about games, mechanics, uh, systems, whatever, uh, we need to ask ourselves, okay, is this working? Why? In this specific case, I'm taking Clash Royale as an example. And the main question is, okay, is this combat that, that Clash Royale has, is it fun? Why is it fun or why isn't fun? Uh, the idea is that the differences create opportunities for strategy and tactics. The differences uh, in units. You have different units, different approaches, different strategies and this results in a fun combat so in this case it's not the balance but the imbalance that that generates the desire and motivation so on this level we can say that yeah the game is balanced is balanced to achieve its objective uh, another thing related to balance is the progression how do we create a proper progression? And the numbers we are using in a game always answer a question. Uh, how long do I want the player to wait to reach the next level? Uh, when will the next level gains pay out to make up for the price I've paid? Uh, the player should be motivated to progress, not uh, forced by the game. So. A good progression creates opportunities and choices instead of a mindless grind. Another key concept is the economy and the design. If you are familiar with Clash Royale, and if you are not, it's a pretty uh, simple concept. You have a player versus player combat. It's a symmetrical uh, combat. Uh, but this is only the gameplay part. You could almost say that it's irre irrelevant if it wasn't for the, the, the cards and the meta and what they mean for, for this uh, particular thing. But this game has a pretty straightforward core loop. You battle with other players and if you win, you receive a chest, a... Uh, yeah, ages. Now you need to wait a certain time for that chest to be opened because you cannot open it right after you won it. And after you open the chest, you upgrade uh, the, the units. And then you go on to the next battle and you repeat the cycle forever. So the idea is that this uh, core loop, we need it be because we want to create variance in the action loop. It makes uh, things interesting and it keeps the player invested. Uh, it allows for players to develop new strategies. And the most important thing is that it really creates a sense of progression and achievement. There's nothing more rewarding than a player uh, finally reaching an higher arena or uh, uh, finally uh, getting that character, that card that he wanted and upgrading it and, uh, you know, destroying other players. Usually when it comes to free to play games, the core loop uh, is filled with other elements elements that are meant to uh, achieve certain objectives. Sorry. Be it monetization, objectives of engagement or retention, doesn't matter. But what you see in free-to-play games usually are time gates, like you need to wait a certain time for something to be delivered, a reward a, or a character upgrade and so on currency gatings you need to spend 
this much uh, soft currency in the game or chance gating. You depend a lot of uh, a lot on loot boxes, and these are means to control the pacing of the game, because freemium games are all about pacing and how the player's journey looks like. The idea is that the longer the player stays in the game, the better. And we have a question from Elitza. I hope I pronounced that right. How does this correlate if it does with any of the motivation core drives like scarcity? This depends on whatever you are trying to achieve. Uh, if you want to, for example, uh, I know, increase monetization, you, you want to create more revenue, then you make a certain resource a bit more scarce. Maybe it drops from certain missions with a, a drop chance or from loot boxes. Doesn't really matter from where. But if you apply pressure, like the resource is scarce, but it's also required in some part of the game uh, for the player to progress, then you are really pushing the player to uh, spend in your game. But this is just an example. I hope I, I got that clear. If not, the chat is our friend. OK, moving on. Uh, still related to economy uh, and design. This is why I was saying earlier that, that graphs are important because it's one thing to look at some numbers and another thing to see a chart like this where we can see a trend line for the player's progression when it comes to levels and difficulties. Uh, the trend line clearly shows a learning curve at the beginning in the earlier levels and it tends to an asymptote and this saw structure with the ups and downs <clears throat> uh, this is a in my opinion a, a very good uh, uh, structure because it it allows us to have difficulty peaks but also relief levels after something super difficult uh, it doesn't really make sense to, to stress the player with more difficult levels. We give him a bit of room to breathe uh, with some easier levels. And then we can build up uh, for, for uh, more difficult levels as the difficulty is increasing and then, bam, it spikes again. And another aspect, another key concept, especially in free-to-play, is the monetization. So what does Clash Royale monetize on? It mainly monetizes on skipping timers, right, from the chests. But how does a player know if this is a good deal for him to pay, I don't know, 47 rubies or whatever they are called now to open the chest now? Well, they have chests in the shop as well. So these chests in the shop are used only for reference. <clears throat> the player knows, or not necessarily knows, but is, a, is able to, to make a more educated idea, guesstimate if you want, uh, about the value of a chest. And then he will see if this is a clear deal or not. Uh, then there's also the, uh, the, the limited time that creates pressure whenever, uh, uh, whenever, do, whenever they uh, have a time pressure, they are more uh, willing to spend. And also the limited purchases. I mean, this also helps to create more pressure. Like you have one day to purchase this item and you can only make two purchases or three purchases, something like this. This sounds like a, you know, uh, 
unique opportunity. And the user feels like he's taking advantage of this opportunity if uh, everything is priced fairly. The monetization's main goal is to create opportunities for the players to take advantage of the game by, by, by spending money, not, not forcing them to spend money. Uh, because whenever players will see a good deal in a game, they will most likely spend. <clears throat> Another example for uh, Candy Crush. Uh, one of the main uh, items they were monetizing, that they are still monetizing on, is uh, buy five more moves uh, at the end of the failed level. When I was working at King, so that was seven years ago, this game was bringing in like a lot of money, 80% of that huge amount of money was made by this particular item. People failing levels and then buying five more moves. So it was uh, pretty amazing to see how a small thing like this generates a lot of uh, revenue. But yeah, and now the tracking and analysis, because as game developers and especially game economy designers or simply game designers we we need to know everything about our game we need to know how players are interacting with the game so when we are uh, when we want to analyze something uh, we need to think about the questions that uh, we're going to ask about our game not a, something as simple as, uh, okay, how uh, are players interacting with this event? Could work, yeah, sure. But something more appropriate or more helpful, actually, would be, is this uh, does this event uh, have a, a good pacing or a good uh, difficulty curve? Uh, does it have, um, does it, give players reasons to spend is it a balanced way too easy for them does it have you know good rewards and so on because starting from the main question we can split it in all the other uh, smaller questions that we are trying to to uh, answer so the idea would be to define what we want to analyze and, and how. But it's also important to always think how we're going to use the, the data that we're tracking before uh, looking into it. Because uh, these things should always have a purpose and, and a game analysis or feature or systems analysis always help us to, to um, understand our game better and properly balance it balance it and then pretty much this would be the flow for uh, uh, when we're talking about data analysis we are doing data analysis because we want to detect the weak points and the opportunities of our game after we've done that we need to define the actions that we want to take, right? Because <clears throat> maybe we want to fix something, maybe we want to improve something, maybe we want to nerf something. The idea is to define the, the actions. Then we implement the actions and we are tracking the results. And only then we can say, uh, we, we can see if we have reached our target. If we haven't reached our, our target, we go back to redefining the, the actions that we want to take, implementing them, tracking results and so on until we are we, we finally reach our target. And that's the moment where we need to decide if we want to expand and optimize. Like if we found that uh, sweet spot, Maybe it's a 
good idea to go all the way and, and properly polish it. So we need to redefine the actions, track re the results and see if we've reached our target. But if we don't want to expand and optimize, we can simply monitor the, the feature uh, periodically because it's, it's important to make sure that it's still healthy. Uh, one important thing is that we really need to understand our game before we analyze it. We really need to know how things are interacting with each other and how are defined, how are they defined. Uh, the analysis that we are making should lead to some something actionable, not just, you know, for satisfying a curiosity, something like this. I mean, yeah, sure, you can do that, but it doesn't help very much the, the game that we are working on. Uh, and it's always good to form a hypothesis on the impact of your changes. I don't know if we are making this event a bit more difficult, uh, we are expecting uh, an increase in monetization and engagement, something like this. This is the hypothesis. Okay. And we make the, all the changes that we think uh, are going to help us to achieve this. And then we monitor this and test the hypothesis. But overall, it's a very good idea to uh, keep an eye on our data. Now, this is an example from uh, Asphalt, one of uh, the games in Gameloft. Uh, at some point, an alarm was triggered when analyzing the data. Uh, the lifetime value of our paying users was reaching its limit, right? So the average weekly transactions that done by, by active paying users was dropping. Uh, the idea is, was that the, as the game grew older, the base of the paying users grew as well, but the older paying users were making less transactions. The hypothesis or the what we thought were, were the reasons. Obviously, older paying users had already purchased everything they needed, every car they needed or wanted and upgraded that to the max. We were only countering this issue when new cars were released. But the thing was that the cost of these new cars and their upgrades was very limited due to its permanent nature. So what we did? We created an additional upgrade system. Okay, now you have Pro Kits. Pro Kits added 25 more layers of upgrade on top of the 20 that already existed. Uh, they granted only a smaller, smaller boosts uh, to to the cars, but they were more expensive and time uh, expensive and time requiring to fulfill. Uh, due to its design being inspired from, from Asian systems, like a crafting system, applying every simple upgrade has a cost in soft currency, but also requires to spend cards. Uh, these cards are obtained uh, either as a reward from a certain system or from time-limited events. Or obviously they can be found in uh, loot boxes that the player would need to purchase. The results were pretty cool. One month after the update, the da daily revenue per daily active uh, user increased by 10% and there was no cannibalization. So players weren't uh, taking their resources from other parts of the game and bringing them uh, and spending them here. No, they created a, a new stream. Uh, of course, the, the player's feedback was positive with good reviews in the App Store. And there were some mid-term and long return uh, retention improvements, slightly increased. But overall, this is a, a good result. And for the optimization part, we've kept on polishing the, the feature. The feature we 
rebalanced it slightly. And we created a wide variety of boxes to offer uh, as time limited rewards, time limited event rewards, promotions, and so on. And this optimization brought in 17%, extra 17% uh, daily revenue lifetime. What I'm trying to say with all of this is that it's super important to keep an eye on what's happening in the game and, and how to uh, how players are interacting with it and simply identify problems and take action. Do you have any questions? If you have, simply write them in the chat. I will stop the sharing for just a bit so I can open my next presentation. And for the next presentation, we will go a bit into more detail about this and about what the game economy designer would be doing in Gameloft mainly. But like I said, the, the role is super similar in other companies. Maybe some of the responsibilities uh, are shifted a bit. Like I said, in some studios, I don't remember exactly where, social point or scopely, I don't know. Uh, the game analysis part is not done by the game economy designer. You have nothing to do with it. Okay. If there are no questions, I'll be moving further with this next one. Is it visible? Can you can you see my my screen? No. Ah, yes. Ah, okay. okay. It just took it a while. Okay. Uh, we'll go through through pretty much the same things uh, as discussed previously, but with a bit more detail. Um, now, who is a game economy designer, and what are the main differences between premium? and freemium, right, free to play, that directly affect the game design. Well, in the case of premium, premium games, uh, early game is key because in order to obtain good reviews and also for, for uh, negotiating with carriers and uh, everything else, you need to have a good impact from the start. So specific areas like gameplay, visuals, and, and art are very important. But the late game is almost irrelevant. Uh, in fact, we, we know a few examples of bestsellers that have solo gameplays with just six hours of duration. I don't remember how long or how short was Portal, but I think it was pretty short. And the game itself is the product that we want to sell. Once it's sold, the work is done. We don't care about it anymore. In the case of freemium games, early game is key, same thing, but it's the key for the initial hook in order to, to convince the player that this game is exactly what they are looking for and to keep them engaged. Uh, secondary aspects like tutorial and difficulty progression have become the key. Okay. Late game is the key to keeping players engaged to the game and monetize them. And the game is our shop window, but not a product, just, just a long-term service that the players can enjoy for free. And at the same time has a continuous offer of in-game virtual products that can enhance players' experience. So, in the last decade or so, we can say that the market uh, has started to shift from premium to freemium games. Like the, the number of, of 
freemium games is, is increasing and on mobile it's dominating the the business model has also changed from a product oriented model to a service oriented one and the design which is the most in interesting part for us uh, has shifted from market oriented towards user oriented so the design team uh, have become lately uh, still the traditional core with all the disciplines that you need producers designers programmers artists and so on but now you also have a game economy designer uh, the main takeaway from here is that this is a job or a position that it's becoming more and more relevant currently i think it's the second place of the most wanted position or most searched for positions by stu gaming studios uh, but what's what is the role of an economy designer uh, every game every genre uh has an audience and that audience has some expectations from the game and th these expectations require a strategy so for example in the case of asphalt we have mostly males that are up to 30 years old this is the core audience i'm talking about they are usually mid hardcore gamers and they have arcade racing experience and they are uh, making like 89% of the total revenue are made on, on cars and upgrades. So this is where the strategy uh, comes in. While this cooking Maria, or I don't remember what the name was, uh, was oriented towards mostly females uh all ages uh casual gameplay uh, game style focused on quick puzzles and and simple gameplay and 81 percent of the total revenue was made on boosters and extra moves so two different games two different totally different uh audiences and and super different uh strategies in the end uh the idea is that the game systems and the loops should be tailored uh, in parallel to the monetization strategy the main elements that that condition free to play strategies and differentiate and differentiate them from from pre premium ones is that the game life cycle has changed we first intro we have an introduction then the game grows reaches a maturity and starts to decline and our main goal has changed so in case of the premium uh, premium games you would simply need to download the, the game and that was it but in the case of freemium you always need to work on retaining and monetizing the players usually premium games uh, use this flow as the main structure right you start the game and you reach the end and you have a completion but most of the premium titles are based on a loop instead of a flow trying to make the system endless or almost endless what we were talking about earlier with the, the core loop this is the same same thing uh, as in the previous presentation, but I think it uh, speaks for itself uh, because uh, in this case the I don't know the most simple core loop that we can think about is like okay you have an action phase then you have a shop because from the action phase uh, you get some resources some rewards of currency random items based on your success and that success is defined by luck skill and the progress you have in the game you take these rewards and go to the shop where you can earn 
permanent advantages in the action phase. And when I'm saying a shop, I'm not referring only to the shop page of a game, but basically every point in the game where you can invest the resources. So if you have a character upgrade system, you take this soft currency or whatever rewards you have, and you invest them in that uh, character upgrade system. Okay. And you use all of this uh, in the progress layer where the difficulty increases and where you unlock new content and you receive new goals. And with a bit of time gating, I don't know, energy, waiting timers, and so on, you go back to the action phase and you repeat this until forever. I mean, that would be the main idea. Uh, as I was saying earlier, or previously, one of the main roles uh, of a game designer is uh, strict, is related to balancing. The idea is that all game elements should be carefully balanced in order to, to cover the goals set in the monetization strategy. <clears throat> we have an in-game economy like the rewards, the production rate, the, the pricing and so on, influenced and influencing the difficulty of the game. You have a difficulty curve, you have the, the XP curve, the player's progression, the unlock requirements for features and so on. And you have all these game stats and which are like fire rate, PVP, top speed, whatever stats you can think of in the game. And all of this should be properly balanced. Okay, this is a perfect scenario, but usually uh, we're uh, getting very close to this. Well, in the case of premium games, the difficulty curve <clears throat> is, I mean, the trend line is always increasing. We usually have some variance in order to avoid boardroom and frustration. And that's everything with it. And with the freemium uh, uh, games, the difficulty curve is what we were discussing about earlier. I have this source structure that is uh, quite effective uh, for keeping players engaged. Now again about analytics, I know that I'm insisting a lot on analytics, but they are, like I said, they are key parts in this because we want to understand the user behavior, the weak points of, of the games and the opportunities. Sorry, Mihai, I have a question. Yes? It's uh, more interesting to work game premium or premier for you? For me? Yes. Uh, honestly, I like to work on freemium more because it's, it's a never ending job. Basically, <laughs> uh, there's always, uh, there's always this quest of understanding the players. We are creating this product for, for them and we want to see how they are interacting with it, how, uh, they are working with it. And in the, the case of, of premium games, you have some particular things set in stone. While in the case of freemium games, you can change them drastically from one update to, to another. I was discussing at some point with my colleagues from, from Barcelona working on Asphalt <clears throat> and they were, they just released Asphalt 9 some years ago. And they were super eager to see uh, the player's progression. And it was super okay up until one point where basically it was breaking. The players were receiving too many resources, not having any more uh, reasons to spend and so on. And I was asking the guys, okay, so what is your plan? What, what do you, how do you want to fix this situation? <clears throat> and uh, they were, yeah. Yeah. What's the most uh, freemium complex game you're working on? 
Oi. I would have to say Sniper Fury. I know it doesn't sound like a, a super complex. It's a static shooter game, mm -hmm. uh, which should be super straightforward, but it was full of features and it was super intricate. It was basically an RPG. Yeah. To keep it like that. And I, for a for me, as a game economy designer, RPGs in general are the most interesting uh, uh, projects to work on. <clears throat> the complexity and the, the challenges are simply interesting. That's not to say that, I don't know, a, a casual idle game isn't mm -hmm. interesting. No, no, no. That, that every, every game, every type of game, every genre has its own challenges because we have games from ranging from from super hardcore shooters uh, action adventures to uh, i don't know japanese erotic games to cats exploding or whatever games do do we have so there's a lot of variety there's a lot to 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 work on them thank you you're welcome <clears throat> okay moving on no, we haven't finished this. So uh, we want the uh, uh, we need the analytics because we want to understand the users' behavior, the weak points of of our games, and the opportunities to improve. So, as a game economy designer, it's always good to to check certain KPIs uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, but we shouldn't, and we won't, uh, we, we don't need to stop here. Uh, we need to understand the player's behavior in depth. And for that, we need to go beyond uh, descriptive stats. You know, things like, okay, what's the average daily uh, revenue or the average daily active users and so on. These are simply stats, if you want. So moving on. For example, a standard way to, to break the averages is splitting the users by spending cohort. Like these are some, some terms that are pretty common in the industry, but minos are players that are spending less than $5 or five euros in a game. And they represent the vast majority of, of players. While the Krakens, the, the guys that are spending more than 100 uh, euros uh, are a tiny fraction, but they have the highest average revenue per paying user. And I'm pretty sure you noticed that some games are, are directed toward Krakens. So we can, if we know what our distribution of players is, and how are they spending? We, we can create uh, specific offers for them. Uh, for example, for the Krakens, we can sell them premium car packs. We can sell them pro kits and everything. While for the Minos, uh, we can sell them the cheap conversion packs, uh, boosters, and some seasons unlocks. But of course, this varies a lot based on the cohorts that you define for your game. Um, we can segment based in, in standard KPIs, like, like spending cohorts or age of players in games. But we are also exploring other ways of segmentation that can be very useful in specific situations. Um, for example, uh, the, the way the players are uh, playing the game, we can uh, define them or we can, we can separate them. For example, in asphalt, we have 56% uh, 50, sorry. 
56% of users are only playing career mode. No interaction with the multiplayer whatsoever. The ones that are uh, focused on uh, career, uh, single player, multiplayer, and time limited events are these guys, 5% of them. So why is this helpful? Because we can actually apply this thing that I was uh, telling you about earlier. It's the thing that continues work on data analysis, gives us actionable solutions to improve the game and the design of our game. Okay, this is, I told you about this before, but I have other examples. For example, uh, there was a problem in, okay. This is very embarrassing, but I forgot the name of the game. doesn't matter. There was a problem because the, the total revenue of the game increased by 46% in, in the two weeks after an update, while the revenue coming from consumable items increased only by 19%. So there was a very low share of consumables, uh, like 7% out of the total revenue. So what we realized was that we had too much consumer, too many consumables in the uh, uh, assortment, like 21, and some of them had effects that were not attractive at all. And the most profitable ones were hidden at the end of the list, at the end of the, the shop. So it was a choice overflow for the player. What we did was to reduce the numbers of consumables in the uh, in what we had uh, to have. So we only kept the most profitable and the most useful ones. So we, uh, in the end, we had only 11 items from 21. We set the display order in the shop based on the revenue. So the most profitable items were in the first place. And of course we changed the name and the visuals because a change like this should also, uh, I don't know, keep things fresh for the player. Uh, the idea was to make it easier for them to understand the effects of the, the boosters. And the results, I mean, the revenue coming from consumables increased by 120%. Uh, and we successfully pushed consumption diversification because these consumables increased their share meaningfully. And there was no cannibalization. Like I said, players weren't bringing, uh, uh, weren't taking their resources from other parts of the game and bring, bring them here. They invested here directly. So, other areas where the game economy designer has a, a voice in um, are uh, the user interface because not only we need to uh, take care of the shop uh, that the game has but everything that has to do with user interface should have the game economy designers feedback level design because it's in direct re uh, relation with the, the difficulty balancing and the monetization game uh, gating the gameplay design again direct relation with the user's experience so it's key for uh, engaging and retaining users and uh, sometimes the story writing because it's important in case of games with the uh, quest flow as core elements uh, if you know all those story games released in episodes usually but they are pretty much like this and this is i thought that it would be useful to know the team structure that uh, it's pretty common in the industry. Of course, you are starting 
from a game manager or a producer and you have all the discipline leads in our case the design team we have the lead designer where you have game designers level designers and other specific uh, designers like i don't know narrative designers system designer and so on and you have the game economy designer uh which is in the direct relation with the world economy design coordinator and these guys are uh, part of the uh, monetization team the world monetization team but like i said this was the case for uh, game loft uh, i know that a lot of other companies have a similar structure but expect to have surprises based on on i don't know the studios and their scope and that would be everything um, so any okay. Question. I hate for question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is uh, your favorite part of your job and your favorite game? Oh, my favorite part of my job. Oh my God. I'm going to sound like a total <laughs> nerd now, but I, I excel when working with Excel because I really like working on simulations for features or games that we have and it's so rewarding when i'm working on a feature i make i i create a simulation in excel so a lot of calculations and so on on which i'm basing my balancing for that feature and then we implement the feature and we track the results and i can see that the players are interacting with the feature as i was intending them to do so i like it because it's the most rewarding it's not because i i control the players destinies and i am basically a god no no i'm <laughs> kidding in your uh, favorite game my favorite game yeah uh currently it's god of war ragnarok i'm a big fan of the series i've played them like since they were on ps2 or something and i basically grew up with kratos and i really like how the conclusion of the story goes right now yeah. we have a question okay uh when you create a system let's say attack defense hp and so on how you get to the balance a uh, good question when you create a system uh, the first numbers that you are going to introduce them are going to be completely arbitrary that is if you are not basing your your uh, system on uh, i don't know a similar system deconstructed from other games it's always good to take inspiration from other games because it's important to see what uh, worked in those uh, games and how and especially understand uh, why did they use those numbers uh, but most of the times you are going to need to start from something and after you have your initial numbers you really need play tests to see how it feels how uh, the those numbers are, are uh, influencing the the gameplay and then you continuously make adjustments this is what the simu the excel simulations are for because you can uh, start from some numbers uh, set a target for yourself like i want the progression to be like this in level 10 i want the player to have everything in the game <clears throat> as long as you have an achievement uh, uh, an objective you can make all the necessary modifications to that system to those numbers uh, to um, achieve your objective you need a direction basically and i hope I, uh, it was clear enough okay florin favorite free-to-play game 
and lifetime spending. Uh, yeah, lifetime spending, I have to, to admit it was Clash Royale back when it appeared. I think I have played it for a couple of years. But my favorite free-to-play game is an older one, uh, Star, Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, actually, because that game also had, I mean, it was, first of all, uh, a Star Wars game, but it was a Star Wars game that was a free freemium Star Wars game that, that was done very okay. They had a lot of systems. They had a lot of, uh, I don't know, complicated or not not complicated complex progression systems and they with each update whenever they introduced something they were building on top of what they had so uh yeah i think it's a pretty good example for a lot of uh, things okay next one Will there be a recording of the stream? Yeah, recording of the stream uh, will be on uh, YouTube Arc Academy channel. Yeah. And I have a question. What you say to people who want to be a game designer economy and what are the steps? I mean, the steps are, are pretty simple if you ask me uh, first you need to like games and play games uh, then once you uh, start uh, investigating what this path has to, to offer what, what the requirements are uh, it all comes down to playing games and asking questions about those games uh, why are things working? Why are things not working? What? Why did they decided to go with this art style? Why? A lot, a lot of questions. There is no stupid question when it comes to to uh, deconstructing games. Uh, and the more you do it, the more you you uh, work on this analytical skill, uh, the better. Another important thing, and I cannot stress this enough, this should be actually be number one on the list. Uh, don't be afraid to fail. Actually, if you can do it, do it like the failing. It's important to fail at things, I don't know, to the, at balancing systems, at, at uh, creating features at, at anything because it's an important uh, step in the process. Uh, failing at stuff helps us make us better, help us make, become better actually, and helps us to understand or to accept that not all the players are gonna like what we are doing in our game be it free to play or, or premium. You cannot make everyone happy, so you should expect to have unhappy people. But in the moment when you understand that that is not a failure on your side, uh, and it's just a matter of taste or whatever, the world is a better place. So play a lot, ask questions, and don't be afraid to fail. This would be the summary. Thank you. Any questions, guys? Okay, maybe it's that. Okay, thank you, Mihai. It's very interesting. I believe the uh, that participant of the master class also find is very useful and inter interesting. Uh, thank you all and good night. Thank you as well. Thank you for having me. I hope you guys found every, all of this interesting. If you have any questions or anything, you can always uh, contact 
uh, Krasmira and she'll contact me or whatever. We'll find the way. Yeah. But I'll be available if you need me with stuff. So thank you and bye bye. Have a great evening. Yeah, bye.